So let's look at the final way to introduce depth of field into your renders. And this is using render passes and um, working in After Effects to apply a blur differentially into different parts of your, uh, onto the different parts of the screen. So we just pop it back into Maya here. Oh, first thing you'll notice that, um, oh geez. I'm missing all those little spheres that were on the surface. It was a next-gen uh, object, and it's not rendering properly with the patch render right now, but it doesn't really matter. Um, so it'll just look a little bit different. So uh, I've put all my objects onto a new render layer. You can see down here on the lower right. And then in the render settings, uh, under Scene and Passes, I've turned on depth. So this will render out a depth pass. And then I've changed the image format to be OpenEXR. OpenEXR um, is uh, a file format with a high bit depth, so it can contain more than one type of uh, render pass. So it can hold you know, your beauty pass, an ambient occlusion, depth pass, it can break up the beauty into um, specular reflection and so on. And uh, so that's useful for doing this sort of thing. So we render that out. We get something like this. So I'll, I've done this once already. So I'll just bring this into a new composition. We can look at it again. So if I duplicate this and then use the effect 3D channel extractor. So this allows you to extract those hidden renders inside and open the XR. So uh, I want to change red, green, and blue to depth. Just leave alpha alone. And see, we get something like this. We just have to adjust the white and black point. Uh, I think I did this already. Oh no, I want to reverse this. Right. So the lighter parts are close to the camera and the darker parts are far away from the camera. And one of the limitations of doing this kind of depth map is you see this kind of halo around the image and that's the because it pre-multiplies it doesn't pre-multiply against the background in the same way that um, the RGB image does when you um, when it does the anti-aliasing. Uh, if you turn on unmultiply, it doesn't make a difference. It makes a slight difference. You can see it actually makes it a little worse. Uh, but what I found is useful is to take this, which is now your depth layer, because we've extracted that. I'm going to rename this uh, depth just so it's easier. I'm going to create a black solid size of the comp, and I'm going to put it underneath that depth layer. And you can see it hides some of that problem. And I'm just going to select these two layers, the depth and the black solid, and pre-compose them. So Command Shift C, and make sure I move all attributes into the new comp are set. And I'll just call this comp depth, uh, depth comp. Okay. So now we have the depth comp on top, and then underneath the matching RGB image. So the simplest way you can do something like this is to use an adjustment layer. So if we create a new layer, uh, pardon me, a new adjustment layer, and we put it underneath the depth comp, and then we put some sort of effect on the adjustment layer. That effect will be felt at every layer below the adjustment layer, not the ones above, just below. So I'll turn off the depth comp for now. And on the adjustment layer, I'll put a fast blur. And I'm just going to turn it up a little high so we can see. Let's put it to, yeah, let's leave it at 12. Turn on repeat edge pixels to get rid of the haloing uh, at the edge. Let's make this a bit bigger so we can see what's going on here. So now if I, with that depth comp on top, of the adjustment layer, I can change the adjustment layer's track mat to be uh, luma inverted. So that means that the blur is applied where it was black before. So where the depth 
comp is black, so you can see back here it's black, um, and where it's white, it doesn't get it. So luma means the brightness of the image, and so wherever there's a bright pixel, because I chose luma inverted, so it's doing the reverse. So wherever there's a bright pixel, it says don't don't place that blur. Wherever there's a dark pixel, it says do place that blur. So now if I turn up the blur just to exaggerate it, you can see it totally blurs at the background. But then you get this weird foggy sort of halo kind of thing. And this is one of the limitations here, is that you it's hard to get very extreme depths of field. So if we go back to 12. And you have to think about what it's doing here. So if Maya is being told not to blur in this region, but to blur strongly in this region because this is black and this is white. What happens on the transition between the two? Well, right on this transition is actually the shape, let me turn off the adjustment layer, of the object itself. So it's good at blurring whatever is inside the object. I'm just going to turn this to Luma so we blur the foreground out. Um, so it's good at blurring the inside of the object, but the edge of the object, it goes from very blurred to not blurred at all. And so you get an unrealistic sharp edge of the object in the blur. That's what happens when there's a, a strong contrast in the depth map where it's white here and black here. Now I'll change this to Luma inverted again and you'll see it works better back here but that's because I put that uh, black um, plane in the background. So if we turn on this again it's kind of hard to see, but here's the actual depth map here, and then here's just the background, but they're both black, so it can blur the edge of the object easily. I still see a little bit of the anti-aliasing here. One thing you can try and do to get rid of that anti-aliasing, if we go into the depth comp, to the depth layer, you can use an effect called Minimax. I think I've got it over here. Uh, yeah, Minimax. So if I drag this in, you can It essentially shrinks or grows the alpha channel a little bit. So I just reduced it, uh, or I just grew it a little bit by one pixel. And you can see, if you just look over here, if I turn that off and on, you can see it helps get rid of that. I don't know how noticeable that will be in the end, but. So this effect can work well when you're just trying to blur out the background elements of a continuous object. I say continuous because this object is both in the foreground and the background. If this object back here was a totally separate background object, I could just render it as a separate path or a separate layer, put it in behind this foreground um, neuron, and then just blur that whole layer out. So that's actually the easiest thing to do. But a lot of the time you've got these things that stretch from the background into the foreground. So that's using an adjustment layer. I'm going to turn off that adjustment layer and let's look at uh, other ways you can do that. So one thing you can do is on the actual RGB layer here, so the color, you can put an effect on here called camera blur. So if we go to blur sharpen effect um, camera lens blur. So you can see when I put that on, it blurs the whole thing out immediately, and that's uh, under blur radius, so I can turn that up, and you can see the blur that you get here. Um, one thing that happens is that you can see it goes black towards the edges, because that's a, because it's sampling outside of the scene. So I can just turn on repeat edge pixels, and it'll fix that. Uh, and this works a, a little better. Uh, this is a more realistic camera blur, because it gives... Um, a shape to the blur, so based on the shape of the aperture of the camera. Uh, right now the shape is set at hexagon and you can change that and it will sort of change the blur a little bit. It's not really visible unless you have uh, like a tiny bright spot in the background, but you can see that it does change the way things blur out. So you could probably use this on that adjustment layer, although I don't think I've ever tried that, but what you're meant to do with this is to attach a blur map to it. So we've already got a blur map. It's this thing here, right? So if we can say which layer, and it's called depth comp. And now you can see it's blurring it out, but we get that same problem where there's extreme blur and then no blur. You get this sharp 
edge. So it's blurred inside the object, but then it doesn't blur over the edge. So let's just try and change some of these settings here to see what we can get. So first of all, uh, the radius is probably too high. Let's just change it to 15 or something. That will really exaggerate those images. Oh, sorry, those uh, artifacts. Um, we can change where the blur focal distance is. So um, if we move this, it's going to move. It's essentially moving the black point or the white point. So now we want this foreground in in focus and the background out of focus. So you can see this actually works pretty nicely. You get kind of a nice uh, blur in the background here. You get nice clarity here in the foreground. You can see, still see we have this kind of halo around here. So you have to kind of live with that if you want to do this. This is a nice effect that you can you could animate this so if you wanted to move the blur. But again there are limitations if you move it all the way in one direction. Um, you will get those artifacts very strongly. So if I just try and push this to get trying to get this into focus, so that's kind of in focus. Now the foreground is blurred, but we get all that artifacting. So to do a rack focus shift is kind of difficult with this. But if you just want to do basic blur like this, that's not changing, this can work quite well. It's not as good as a uh, real blur out of Maya, but uh, not bad. You can do things like change gain. It's going to brighten up the image, I think, a little bit. Let's just see if, yeah, I can see in the highlights some changes here. So it's just, it's blowing up the whites a little bit. Change threshold and saturation, stuff like that. So this is the camera lens blur. Uh, so you need a depth map with this and it can work pretty well. As long as you're not pushing it too hard and it works better with a subtle blur. But let's just compare what it's like without it at all. So the image is quite flat. It's unclear where this background, whatever this is, axon or dendrite is. It could be growing out of this one in the foreground. Um, but as soon as you turn this on, it pushes it into the background for us. So it adds depth into our scenes. You can do other things. Um, you can combine these two things. So if I turn on this adjustment layer again, I don't want the blur on here now, but I can use this adjustment layer for other depth cues like uh, desaturation. So with this adjustment layer, if I turn on the color correction, uh, hue and saturation, and if I just, I'll just do an extreme version, but you can see it's desaturating stuff in the background. It's also desaturating a bit in the foreground. So this can be subtle. You can also do a, a slight color shift if you want to chroma map so the stuff in the background is a little bluer. But you really have to separate the foreground out from the background for this to work with a, with a strong um, depth map. So you can combine those things. Now the last method I'm going to show you is using a third-party plugin called Frischluft, which is a great plugin to purchase um, if you're doing a lot of this stuff. So uh, I have this. So on the neuron with depth layer, the RGB layer, I'm going to use this uh, depth of field plugin. And it works very similar to uh, in a similar fashion to the camera lens blur, you have to choose a depth layer, use depth comp, and then you can have to turn up the radius. The radius is the, the blur amount here. So you can see it's, it's dealing with the fringe a little bit differently, but I haven't set the focal point yet. You can use this selector to move into your scene and click where you want it to be in focus and it will look at the depth map and put that in focus. And so you can see that does a pretty nice job. It's giving this kind of chromatic aberration along the fringe. Um, we can do things like change the shape of the iris. Right now the facets are set to three so it's triangular. I usually set it to six and I turn off the rounding so I get a sharper edge. <clears throat> 
that's not going to be again that visible unless you've got things that are blurred out um, like little bright spots in the background so you can animate this point moving along so if I move this here it will change the area that's in focus I can even move it right back here to that back neuron and you can see it's still not perfect in the foreground but it's dealing with this edge in a different way I'm not sure exactly what they're doing but they're trying to accommodate for that drop-off between black and white um, so again it's not going to be as good as the renders straight out of Maya uh, when you use depth of field but uh, it can work well enough in a lot of situations especially if you want to animate this blur so I could so my focal point here so this is selecting the depth but I can animate the focal point using this too so right now the focal point has got this foreground stuff in in focus so I'm going to pull it in a little tighter so something like this is in focus here or around here so I'll key that and then over one second I can move that focal point so the background elements are in focus so something like not quite so maybe too far So something like that, and then we can, I'll play the, I'll preview it. Uh, I'm at a third resolution preview, just so it goes more quickly. So we can get that kind of rack focus shift. So you can do that with the camera lens blur too, uh, but it just won't deal with this foreground blur quite as well. And even this is not that great. Oh, I think uh, one thing you might want to turn off to help that, I think, is gamma correction. Yeah, actually, sorry. If you turn off gamma correction, it gets some of that discoloration in the fringing. Um, still, it's not perfect in the foreground, but it can it can work well enough, especially if your camera is moving and the, the audience can't linger on any part of the screen for too long. Anyway, so that's the last of the uh, depth of field rendering options in Maya. Um, I hope it helps.